So David, you look like the most conservative, well-mannered, <laughs> like put together young guy I like that you could possibly come across. <laughs> and then you come here and you tell me like you're a drug addict. It's really, even though I hear you say that, it's like, and even though I know what that means, it's like really hard to picture that. So how in the world did you get involved in that whole mess? Um, it started at a pretty early age. Um, <clears throat> when I first, around 13, when I first drank or had drugs, um, I found out that it made me a different person. I went from being a very reserved, shy guy at parties or in school even. And when I drank for the first time or smoked weed for the first time, that went away. I wasn't that shy person anymore and I could be the guy dancing on top of the table in the middle of a party. Um, so at an early age, um, I had this sense that I needed, I wanted that to become this person I thought in my mind I needed to be. Okay. What kind of family did you come from? Like, what's your family background? Um, really good. I came from a very reserved Christian Grew up in a Presbyterian church family. They took me multiple times a week. They were very involved. Um, I'd say I didn't go through any like traumatic events um, growing up. Um, I mean, I had for everything that I needed and more. I had I was given a lot of things too, um, and I was also shown a work ethic at a young age where if I did want like the new Nintendo that was coming out, I had to go to my dad's store and work for that. Um, and I started working for him at age 12 when it was, I'd sweep the floors, mop the floors, help with inventory, stuff like that to earn those extra things that I wanted. Um, but no blow ups, like even as a kid, I can't remember my family ever, my mom and dad never raised their voice in front of me. Like I'm sure that they had their, their issues, but they would do that behind closed doors. Like we never saw that as kids. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay, so, so even though you came from a good family, you still just struggled a little bit with um, being sort of shy, maybe a little socially anxious. Yeah, I would say anxiety. Um, anxiety. And that's something that my mom definitely has. She comes off, she's a very shy, anxious person. Um, so I think that was kind of passed down to me. Um, well, and I have a little bit more of my dad's personality. I'm a little more outgoing than my mom is, but um, I'd say that anxiety carried over and it didn't sit right with me. Okay. And I found drugs and alcohol that would mask that a little bit. It would, I didn't have to worry about that feeling anymore, that tingling it or... fixed it. It fixed it. Missing piece, like it you did. hear in so many stories. Yeah. Okay. So did it, were you one of these people that like, when you use the first time, it was just like, that was it? Or did it take a while to develop? Like, how did that progress? I'd say, um, I'm not going to sit here and tell you I loved the taste of alcohol <laughs> right when I had it. That wasn't the case for me. I didn't necessarily love it, um, but I loved how it suppressed my emotions. I, it was like putting a, a suppressor on my anxiety and my fears, um, and it allowed me to be like Super Dave. That's who I wanted. I wanted to be Super Dave, and that was it for me. So it fixed, it fixed something that you wanted to fix. Yes. When did, when do you think it became problematic? Like, when did things start to get out of control? Um, I mean, pretty early on. I'd say by the time I was in ninth grade, I had graduated from alcohol and weed to cocaine. I was prescribed Adderall. I was crushing the pills up, and I can remember snorting my Adderall, like, in algebra class, like, at school. Wow. Right, like, the teacher would have her back to the to me facing the board and I'd be taking a rail off of my algebra book. Did your parents have any clue you were doing drugs at all? I don't think, definitely not. Um, I think they may have caught me once or twice smelling like weed or with my, my eyes red. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think, they didn't know I was abusing Adderall or drinking on weekends. They probably just thought like, oh he's a teenager, like getting in a little trouble, but not nearly, they didn't know anything about the extent of it. No, okay. not at all. I'd say it really progressed 
um, when I got to school, when I got to college. And too, a part of me thought it was just, that was a cool guy to be, the guy that does all the drugs, that drinks all the beer. And I can remember my first night getting moved into my apartment at college. People were out mingling in the parking lot of the new apartment complex that everyone was moving into. And I went up to a group of guys and my first question was, where do I find drugs around here? And one of the guys was like, man, I know I like you already and put his arm around me. And that was like, boom, instant connection, right. fitting right in. So you were really attached, I mean, the drugs were, but you were attached to the identity. Definitely. Of Super Dave. Yep. Mr. Cool Guy. Yes. Okay, that was important too. Yeah, loved that. Um, and then, you know, later, I didn't make it long in school before it, it was too problematic. Um, it just, I didn't want to go to class anymore because I'd rather do drugs. Um, I had a, a big first heartbreak there in college. Um, and I went straight down the rabbit hole with that. Like to deal with those emotions, I went to what I knew. Um, how did I deal with anxiety and fear and depression? Drugs, drugs and alcohol. Sort of ran from it. But it really ramped up there at that point. I went from, because at that point I discovered Oxycontin. I discovered opiates and I loved it. I loved downers. I wasn't much of an upper guy, which I think I did that to be cool or to seem cool back in high cool school. Dave might do, or Super yeah. Dave might do that to be cool, but you didn't like the effects of that as much yeah. as the other. I was much more of a downer guy. So when I found Oxycontin, yeah, it took one time and I loved it. It wasn't like alcohol. It wasn't like... So it was kind of a love at first sight. It's yeah, kind of and weed kind of was too, but okay. Oxycontin much more so. Okay. Absolutely loved it the first time I did it, and it was an escape for me. It was my anxiety, my fears went out the window, and I could just relax. I could sleep, I could, you know, I didn't have to worry about anything. Those Oxycontins are awfully expensive though, aren't they? They are. That's what usually leads to the demise. How did that go for you? Um, so I went, I actually saw the spike of the pill when I was going through my stuff. Um, used to, I could get them when I first started around 30 or 40 bucks a pill for an 80 milligram and that would last me a while. Mm -hmm. But by the end of it, they were $80 a milligram. So it was $80 for an 80 milligram pill and I needed like four or five of them a day. Uh, so I had to dive into that lifestyle completely to be able to afford it. That's an expensive habit. Um, so this is kind of when you went from just trying to be like super day into like, now your life revolves around like obtaining this drug, like I have to. This is survival okay. mode, right? At this point it's, in my it's life. It's gone from being cool to surviving. Yep. It's not cool anymore. It's like, I have to have this to be okay. Um, and I had my parents convinced that like, they thought it was weed and I just told them I needed weed. But when I got pulled from college, um, obviously it came out that the problem was much bigger than drinking and marijuana. So they started asking me questions and it came, I got honest with them and told them it was pills. Um, and I had to, I tried several different methods. I tried the methadone clinics, the boxing, um, that wasn't helpful for me. Um, in fact, I just kind of dove deeper into it. What, what, how did that work out for you? Like, so those are things that a lot of people on pain pills try, suboxone, methadone, all that kind of stuff. Why didn't that work? It got me high. Okay. I mean, it was, it was something else I could abuse. And once I figured out that, oh, I can get high off of this, then it goes back into abu an abusive relationship with that. The same cycle mm. as you were, okay. Um, and had you talked to your parents, <clears throat> were you buying methadone and suboxone off the street or were you going to like a methadone or suboxone clinic? I was going, I come from a really small town, so I was going to a family doctor who was prescribing methadone to me. And your, did your family know that's what you were doing? Mm -hmm. So they were, they were trying to support you, they thought this was the best way to help you? Yes. Okay. Um, but what they didn't know is that then I was buying extra methadone off the streets mm -hmm. um, and increasing my habit and my intake of the drug. Gotcha. Um, 
So that went on for a while. Um, I mean, at some point, keeping up, especially a pain pill addiction, it just is so expensive. It consumes all of your time. It is a full time job. Mm -hmm. And so you can't, eventually, you stop being able to manage life and manage that at the same time. So when did that start happening for you? When did life get unmanageable? And what did unmanageability look like? Ooh, I'd say it was a couple of years into using opiates um, and just being submersed in the lifestyle of selling drugs in order to buy my drugs. Um, I was living in a world that breeds anxiety, it breeds depression, it breeds fear um, from getting mugged to, I mean, being on the cops radar getting caught by the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, um, you know, it just instilled a lot of fear in me and it turned me into this recluse, to this guy who was scared of the world and not just situational. I think the drugs played a big part in my, what was going on in, in my brain as well. But I mean, I was, for a year, I became this person who was scared to leave his apartment, who was scared to drive. Um, I completely shut everyone out of my life. Uh, there was even a period of time where I, I wouldn't even look at my mom. I didn't even want to look her in the eyes. Um, I don't know if I was ashamed of myself. I'm sure that had a part to do with it, um, but mostly just scared, scared of judgment and not being good enough and being alone. And um, I remember a time where she would have to like go get food for me and drop it off. And there were some days where I couldn't even open the door for her. She'd have to like, leave it at the doorstep and I'd look out of my blinds and wait till she left. And then as soon as she did, I would go get the food and eat. I was just that scared. So it kind of is this combination of, you're already sort of naturally anxious person. And that's, that's kind of why the problem developed in the beginning. But now you've got already this natural anxiety and then you've probably got a little paranoia layered on top because of the effect of the drugs themselves and that all combined with the fact that you've been living this super sketchy lifestyle where like for real bad stuff happens and so now it's not just some social anxiety it's real like crippling fear mm -hmm. yeah and if you look at the grand at the whole the big picture I mean I went from taking these drugs to be super Dave and then I was taking these drugs and I was the opposite of Super Dave. I was a broken individual, um, who, but needed that to survive. Because what happens if I don't get my fix? I get sick, and that's not fun. Nobody wants to go there. Yeah, opiate withdrawals won't kill you, but you will feel like you're dying. So a lot of times I hear people, you know, the thing about people addicted to opiates is that they usually like steal stuff or they do bad stuff to get the drug, and that and that part of what creates like the really bad rap around this particular drug because they're so expensive and I hear people say like I would never steal from my grandmother like I can't believe this person did this I would never do this I would never do that what do you say about that I mean in my personal experience um, I was the opposite of what you just mentioned I was I was the guy who didn't really want to steal from his friends but I would steal from my mom and dad all day I develop this mentality of what's yours is mine. Like you brought me into this world and to the point I remember popping a diamond out of my mom's ring to pawn. To, like you owe it to me almost. Yeah, almost in a very entitled mindset, selfish mindset to get my fix. Um, is that because you're, were you sort of naturally like an entitled selfish person? Where does that come from? I don't think so. I mean, I feel like I was raised where you, to know that you work for what you want. Um, but when it comes down to not having your fix, not having your drug, it's like I said, survival mode. It's like a life or death situation to me in that moment where um, I was willing to do anything. I mean, don't get me wrong, I would steal from my friends. I was the guy that would steal your drugs and then help you look for them and make you think you dropped them under the couch or something. And I already smoked it. Um, but I would definitely turn to like theft in those situations. What, so if the family members are watching this, what is withdrawal like? So when people say I had to use so I wouldn't get sick, what does 
that mean? What can you help us understand that? Oh man, it's hard to explain. I mean, it is. It literally feels like death is coming upon you. Like you're the first time I went through withdrawals, I didn't know what was happening to me, and I just thought I was dying. Um, cold sweats nauseous all the time um, and just the mental part of it and two I was like an anxious depressed wreck at the same time um, and the first time I went through withdrawals um, I remember spending like two days on the bathroom floor wouldn't leave my mom would like sit there with me uh, putting wet cloths on my head it was just miserable um, and at that point you knew you were Yes, by that time, like once I'd been there for like a day, I knew that drugs had caused this. Okay. And you were trying, you were trying to get yourself clean? Yeah. Well, that was like with the clinics when I went through that period of my okay. life. So it took some trial and error. Yes. What are all the things you tried that didn't work? I tried um, methadone. Suboxone, and like I tried the church thing, getting back, my, that was important to my mom to just, let's get you back involved in church. And I tried that, um, I tried it on my own, of course, that didn't work. Uh, none of those things did. It wasn't until I like got away from my friends and my playground. Did you ever try a common thing is like, okay, I have a problem with this drug, and so if I just stop that, it'll be okay, but I can still do this over here. Did you ever do that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I tried mixing, making my own cocktails and drugs. And, um, you know, it still turned into, like, I was messed up on something every day. Maybe it wasn't. I got to a point where I didn't need opiates every day, but it was either weed or even acid or mushrooms, like anything that would alter my state of mind that could get me away from the anxiety and depression, I would do it. Okay. So it was just something all the time? Yes. Okay. So how did you, how did, did you go to treatment? Did you just go to A? How did you get better? Yeah, so I'd say my, to go back a little bit to my breaking point was when my dad passed away in 2012 and um, I started to spiral downhill fast whenever that happened. Um, I went back to using opiates, methadone, whatever I could get my hands on, um, and even somewhat suicidal at that time. Um, and I, I ran, and when I say I ran, that means like I was using heavily for about two months after he passed away. And um, I was suicidal one night, and I was like, I'm either gonna try to kill myself or I'm gonna get help. <clears throat> and um, Luckily, the way I was going to try to commit suicide didn't work out, and my other option, for some reason, in my head at the time, in my my addiction, <laughs> whatever was going on at that time, I, I know I was messed up. Um, I was drunk and high at the time, but I gave myself the option of like, okay, well, let's try to commit suicide. If it doesn't work out, you're going to ask for help. And it didn't work out. So I went to my mom crying that night. And I was like, look, I've got to have help, but I, I can't do it here. I've got to go away. I've got to be around new people. Um, and luckily, two days later, my sister had found, my mom told my sisters about it. And um, she had found a place that seemed like a good fit for me. It was a place that was going to keep me active, get me out of my head. And it was a horse ranch um, treatment where I was there for around 60 days. And so at that point you were just, you'd hit a bottom and you were just willing to go to treatment. Mm -hmm. You were ready. In that moment, I was ready. <laughs> but once I got to treatment, I, I mean, I spent one day there and I was fighting it immediately. Okay. I was calling my mom saying, come get me. If you don't come get me, I'll kill myself. Wow. Um, like you better come right now or I, I will end my life just throwing threats around left and right and the one thing she had the the best card she played was like will you please do this for me i just lost your dad and i don't want to lose you too um and 
that stuck with me for a little bit while. It would keep me there for another two days. It's kind of her ace card. Yep, that was the ace in the hole. And it'd keep me there for like another two days. And then I'd call again and I'd say, seriously, now I've had enough. If you don't kill, if you don't come get me, I'm gonna kill myself. Uh, and I'd even come up with plans. Like I'd been thinking about this of like, I was at a horse ranch and I was gonna hang myself from the rafters in the bar. Were you really? Were you really making a plan on killing yourself, or were you trying to like emotionally blackmail your mom, or both? I, it was emotionally blackmail my mom. So you never really thought that you were going to do that. Uh, it was definitely a thought, not one that I wanted to act on, but it was mostly to get my way. And my plan was like, as soon as she comes and gets me, I'm gonna get back home and I'm gonna go get some morphine or whatever I can get my hands on. Okay. Um, so I would definitely majority blackmail. So how long did this whole like begging to come home phase go? Um, at least a few weeks, probably the first three weeks that I was there. Um, and I would beg to talk to my mom. They didn't want to let me talk to her. Right. Uh, a lot of treatment centers don't let that happen. Did they listen in like they knew what you were doing when you talked to her? Yeah, they would like sit in the next room. Okay. Um, but they would let me talk to her and I'd beg and beg and beg and she'd play that card of like, please do this for me. Like I just lost your dad. I don't want to lose you. Let's get you better. It's going to be hard. You've got to fight through it. Um, to make me stay and eventually after a couple of weeks two or three weeks I was like okay I, I'm gonna stop pressing her I'm gonna finish this but as soon as I get done I'm gonna go back home so it's kind of like okay fine I'll do this yep. this is it yeah I finally was just gave in I was like okay I'll do it but this is it and then I'm coming back home okay but then when it got time to leave that wasn't the case she so was like I how long were you this was the horse ranch treatment right yeah so how long were you how long was that for about 60 days I was there. Okay. Yeah. Um, and when it came time to leave there, she had a different plan. My mom said, look, I want you to go to an extended care, sober living. And I just put my foot back down. I was like, no, I'm not doing it. That's not gonna happen. And we went back and forth for a few days and she played the, like, come on, please do this for me. Do it for your dad. He would want to see you getting better. And I was like, okay, fine, I'll do it, but I get to pick the place. And uh, <laughs> I literally, I got on Google at treatment and I Googled snowboarding and halfway house because I was like, if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna have fun. I'm gonna do something I wanna do. Mm -hmm. um, and I found a place in Asheville. Um, so I was like, all right, found one, this is it. We'll go, you need to call them. And she called them and the guy called me and talked to me. and made me feel really good about coming. He was like, look, I, I think you're gonna love it here. You're gonna get here. These guys are gonna love you up and down. They're gonna give you hugs. You'll, you'll have a community. And uh, I went with it. Was it like that when you got there? Um, it was not, I mean, I told him, I was like, look, man, I'm really anxious. Mm -hmm. I don't wanna see a lot of people right when I get there. <laughs> So they kind of made special plans for me. Everyone, when I got there, everyone was at dinner where I could kind of like see the place, get a feel for where I'd be sleeping. It was perfect the way they set it up for me. But not be bombarded. Exactly, okay. yeah. And not have all of these people trying to talk to me or mm -hmm. um, give me hugs. I wasn't much into that. <laughs> um, but then it was, I mean, it was that community of like, these guys cared about you and they picked you up when you were down and you helped pick them up when they were down. It turned into that. Um, and I'd say it wasn't until maybe a month into that extended care or that um, recovery residence that I decided for myself that I wanted to be sober. What do you and think was it? What was, what made you turn that corner? I think a lot of it was seeing progress that I had made. My anxiety, my fear, it had gone down over this long period of time without drugs and alcohol. Like, naturally my body started to go back to its norm. You felt better. I felt better. My, I could sit in one place for longer. Um, I wasn't just a fidgety, anxious mess. Um, and I could feel that. I could also feel the love, the community that was there. And I could see other guys my age 
doing the same thing that I was trying to do and wanted the same thing. They wanted to change their life and that wore off on me. Mm -hmm. And then I, I got to this point where I just thought, well, if I'm actually feeling better, why wouldn't I continue this? Mm -hmm. And that was like the big click for me, the big turning point, which isn't that hard of a thing to realize or notice. Um, but when your head's that foggy from drugs and alcohol, it, it's hard to it's hard to believe that you will feel better because when you're stuck in it, it's like the drugs or the alcohol is the only thing that makes you feel better. And when you don't have them, you feel so horrible. Mm -hmm. And so when people tell you like you'll feel better, you really don't believe them. Yes. Yeah, do you think that's impossible? Mm -hmm. Do you think was there any part of it that was like you know when you were younger? Part of it was it alleviated the anxiety, and the other part of it was wanting to be super day. So once you're in a different context and you're around all these other young guys, what it takes to be super day changes on you, right? So yeah. is there any like it's like peer pressure in a in a positive way? You want to fit into that play any into your recovery at all? Yes, definitely. I mean, I didn't want to get a sponsor, but that's what everyone else is doing. Um, I thought that that was weird to go. I mean, it was like I was asking another man out on a date is mm -hmm. to go say, hey, will you take me through the steps? Um, that was tough. But uh, when you see all of these other young guys doing it and getting positive results back from that, of course, you want to go try that too. That peer pressure just draws you in. Mm -hmm. okay. So at that point, that's what you needed to do. You kind of figured you need to do that to fit in and do what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be that person. I wanted to change from the old lifestyle and be the guy that does right. I mean, I made it a point to like cover all of my bases when I was living in that sober living. It was to make sure my bed was made, my chore was done. Even if other guys didn't do it, I wanted to be the guy that was like above and beyond. So you still had this, I want to be super day. Yes. But the definition of what that meant changed. Changed completely. Okay. Because you're very much a, I want to do the right kind of thing guy. Like, who you are as a person is definitely that. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think another big thing is um, looking back at the past, drugs and alcohol gave me an excuse. Like, if people would say, Oh, why did you do that last night? That was so messed up. I could say, Oh, that wasn't really me. That was. I was messed up. I had, I'd been drinking all day. I had smoked weed last night. Come on, dude. So you, you didn't know have I'm to not like that. You didn't have to be responsible for the behavior you had. Exactly. How long were you in extended care? I was in extended care for around five and a half to six months. And then I moved from there to a three quarter house for another month, month and a half okay. before I moved out. And what happened to you? After that, I found a house um, that I wanted to rent, and I was very nervous moving out of a sober living. Um, obviously, I wanted to live with other sober people, but how do you, what do you do in case if someone else relapses? Is that gonna bring me down? Or So what I did was I rented a house where I was the only one on the lease, and I created my own contract that guys had to sign to live with me. Um, that basically went over like if you refuse if I think you're using you have to take a drug test if you refuse to take the drug test it counts as a positive so or, you, this is like your first effort makeshift recovery house here exactly like you that's where it really started think you were doing that but you kind of were yeah okay that's cool yeah so I had my own little contract there and it kept the house safe I mean if if guys did use if they did have a dirty uh, positive drug screen then they had 24 hours to get their stuff out did you have to enforce that I did. Once, twice, a bunch of times? A few times. A few times. Was it yeah. hard? It was at first, but then it got old. Um, and it got to a point where it's just like, okay, well, this is my house that you're in. You're jeopardizing other people's recovery in it. You need to go get help. Like, we need to get you somewhere. And even in that case, I would often like recommend, try to get them back into a treatment facility. Okay. So how did you get into the field? How did you make that transition? Um, as I was going through sober living or extended care, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. Like I'd had lots of people carry me and help me through that. Um, and I wanted to give that back in a way. Um, 
so immediately I started asking around for recovery jobs where I was in North Carolina. Um, the place where I went, they were like, yeah, you can drive for us if you want to pick guys up from the airport and help take guys to meetings and stuff. So I started there and just having recovery talk in the car and loved it. Um, and then I started to work for a treatment center, but I was managing their um, transitions program, their extended care, this treatment centers, uh, working with young guys there and managing that program. And, I just knew, I knew that that's, it was like my calling. Mm -hmm. It just felt right. It felt right. And that's when you decided to start your own, officially. Yes. Um, so the one I was working for, they actually changed their program and went from, they went more to, um, uh, it was more of a treatment almost than a sober living, where it was very intense IOP, they didn't get much real world experience. So I went to the CEO and I was like, well look, I really like transitions and bringing the real world into this. Um, I think it's really important and it was important to me. Um, so if it's okay with you, I'd like to take your program and go somewhere else with it. And he gave me the thumbs up. So that's when I broke away from the corporation and started my own thing. When you were in your own personal sort of recovery journey, what was the hardest moment? Can you think back, was there a, a moment or a day or a time that you can think of that was like the most difficult time? Like even in recovery? Yeah. Um, like in the first six months. I don't know. I'd say, I think for me, uh, it was a little longer than that. I was riding a cloud for a while. Okay. I mean, well, I, at the very start of it was very hard when I was sending out suicidal threats to my mom to come get me. Mm -hmm. um, but then I, once I calmed down, um, I'd say it wasn't until around like nine months where I, I, I started to struggle again. And for some reason, I was like, do I really want to do this? Mm -hmm. Um, should I go back out? Should I go try to score something tonight? Um, but I was, I, would, I was almost brainwashed to an extent. I'd been to so many meetings and I'd heard so many people say, just pick up a phone, call me. And my sponsor told me that over and over. And that night, I remember having just having a really bad night and wanting to go get some beer, just some beer to take the edge off. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what? Well, it's just alcohol. It's not like I'm getting back into drugs. But I called him instead, and he said, stay right where you are, I'm coming to get you. Mm -hmm. And like we rode around for a while, and um, that was like a big moment for me that night. Um, and it was around nine months. And then another time where I struggled um, was a little bit after that, around that 10 months, I started dating a girl, and then that first breakup was rough. Um, and she was also, sober so like I didn't want to go to meetings that she may be going to it made it difficult I didn't want to go to meetings that she may be going to because I didn't want to see her because it, it hurt I didn't even want to I wanted to run from that mm -hmm. uh, so it kind of takes your safe place and contaminates it a little bit it did yeah and I'm not saying that it's like you should have never date someone else that's in recovery if you're in recovery because there are a lot of pros to it as well but that is some Yep, you definitely need to think about that because it, it made it tough for me. What's been, do you have any moments that have been the really great moments, the really good moments since you got some? Definitely. Um, I mean, things continue to happen over and over again. I mean, one is um, starting my own, this sober living, this extended care, a recovery residence. I just threw out three different terms there. But, um, you know, starting that was great for me. Um, I just got a fiance, and that, that's great. You know, that, these things wouldn't happen if I weren't sober. Um, I just had a guy graduate from our program with a year. He picked up a year in the house. That's incredible. Like, those are great moments in my life that I won't ever forget um, for being sober. 
what's your best piece of advice for any young person struggling? To give in, to ask for help. Um, don't be ashamed. Um, because if you can put the energy that you put into drinking and drugging towards getting sober and bettering your life, I mean, it, it'll be incredible. It'll be an epic journey. What's the best piece of advice that you have for any family member of someone struggling? Um, You know, I haven't been on the other side of it. I've heard from my mom what it's like, um, and I know it's tough, but, you know, to hold hard boundaries. Don't continue to enable, uh, and that can be extremely hard at times. As hard as like not going to pick up your loved one if they're saying they're gonna kill themselves if you don't. Um, but just uh, hold boundaries and and get them the help that they need.